Okay, everybody. Uh, well, welcome back into the uh, online education series. It's good to be back with all of you for our, I think this is our fourth year rolling through this. Uh, and it's great to see so many people getting on here. This is awesome. And um, we appreciate your patience too with us sort of getting the schedule out. It's been um, a juggling act to be sure. And, and um, kudos to my co-chair, Sean English, who's uh, on with us and our membership director, Christine Alonzo, for uh, the hard work and trying to get uh, everything sort of plugged into place and working with everybody's schedules and all that. So we're excited to get it going and we'll cover the schedule a little bit upcoming before we're done today, just to remind everyone of what we have upcoming and what's sort of in the pipeline that's going to be added to the, to the, uh, to the list. Uh, but first off, I mean, we're excited to uh, have Ryan Crawley, the education director for Sportsbox AI on with us, Ryan, thanks for doing this, man. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, excited to be able to kind of present about 3D here. Um, you know, first, just to give a little bit of background on myself. So I'm a PJ member. I'm a coach. I've been coaching for the past uh, roughly 12 years now. Um, and, you know, I've been using 3D, I would say, you know, teaching with it probably a good seven, eight years. Um, but I did use it as a player. The coach that I worked with uh, used it and uh, kind of showed me the importance of using it. So I'm really excited to be able to just talk about, you know, Sportsbox. And for those that are unfamiliar with Sportsbox, we're a markerless 3D system. So if you're used to hearing about like gears or KVEST or any system where you have to put all these sensors on you, um, we're very fortunate that we can just do this off of your phone. So it's just a face on slow motion video. And then from there, we can give you some, some great data. So what, I want to kind of talk a little bit about today is mainly just the essentials of, of using 3D um, and starting to get this into your guys' just daily lessons um, and finding use for it. So I always think it's important for us to kind of, you know, debunk the myth that 3D is for good players only. I mean, I'm fortunate. I get to talk to coaches all the time and, and show them this product. And a lot of coaches think, well, this is too much information. My students don't need this. Uh, and I think it comes from, you know, good players are the ones that have, you know, been using 3D for so long that we just assume it's meant for them. Um, but I think as you guys start to teach with Sportsbox or a 3D system, you'll start to realize like how much easier it is for your students to be able to understand this, this 3D data that we're going to run through. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through just a bunch of examples, be able to show you guys how you just use this and see the common mistakes that you would normally see in a lesson. You know, one of the biggest mistakes that I find that coaches make when using 3D, or at least starting with Sportsbox, is they want to turn on all the different trackers. So if I just analyze a session here to start, it's going to pop up with a nice little 3D avatar. And most coaches right off the bat, what they're going to end up doing is they're going to start looking at all this data. And it just becomes a little overwhelming. So the beautiful part about this is we can make it as easy or as complex as we would like to make it. You can add just one or two numbers. And when you're teaching, you guys have taught thousands of golf lessons. You guys are all amazing instructors. And so when you're watching somebody swing, you kind of have an idea of what you want to be able to present to them and what you would like to fix in their golf swing. And from there, it's just finding the little, you know, tidbit of information that's going to help support it. So this right here is a player that came to me just a little while ago, um, you know, looking at his golf swing. The first thing that I just wanted to point out to him was his setup. You know, if we look at this side bend number, so he has five degrees of side bend. The tour average, I believe, is right around 15. Um, we're going to see that his left shoulder gets very, very low uh, to start in his setup. And it, it really influences how his body is going to pivot and, and turn throughout the, the swing itself. So I'm going to pull up his chest sway, his pelvis sway. It's going to be zero to start. And we're going to be able to see how much it's moving. Because this player had just so little of side bend, um, we're going to notice that he's going to get this classic reverse pivot and reverse spine angle. When you see him at the top of his backswing, you can see that his chest has basically stayed at like zero, uh, but his pelvis has moved 
0.8, let's call it an inch further away from the target. And then that gets him so that he's got that reverse pivot where he's just kind of leaning back. And so it was really easy to help improve this player and fix his swing and just relate to him. Hey, all we need to do is just fix your setup. All right. And so what we ended up doing in his setup, just making him feel like his left shoulder was higher, right? In the setup there, let's give him a little bit more of that side bend. And from there, it made it really easy for him to start pivoting around his body properly um, and not getting that reverse pivot. So this is just like a really simple, easy way that you could, you know, use this in, in a setup example and, and how it relates to everything. All right. Let me pull up another example here. And Ryan, while you're doing that, I just want to remind everybody, uh, if you have a question, since everybody's muted, um, just type it into the chat. Uh, Sean and I will be monitoring the chat and we'll inter intervene and throw some questions your way, Ryan, if, if people have specific questions to the information. Okay. Yeah, please jump in with any questions that you guys have. All right. So a common fault that we see in a golf swing is lack of depth, right? Players hands getting too high or just not getting behind them enough. So I'm going to run through three different examples and kind of why it's happening and how you can show this in 3D. So this right here is one of my players. His name is Evan. Um, I'm going to pull up his mid hands lift number. So it's actually going to trace how much his hands are moving up and down, uh, which is a really good visual to be able to see. What we're going to notice for Evan uh, in his golf swing is he does a really, really good job of turning to start. So as he gets this club back, you know, shaft parallel here, he's going to have 41 degrees of turn with his chest, 23 degrees with his pelvis. Really, really good. The tour average is 40, 20. So he's right where he needs to be. What ends up happening for Evan here is he doesn't really hinge the golf club great. And when he doesn't hinge the club great, his hands start to actually lift too much. And what ends up happening then in his body is we're going to see that his chest starts to lift. And so you can watch his chest, it's at 0 0.1. So let's call it zero once again, watch as he goes up to the top. And then you can see the yellow line there that's tracing his hands. You can see how vertical it gets. And so for Evan, his hands get really high at the top. You know, it's not a product of him not turning, right? Cause he actually turns really, really well. Um, it's more of a product of him just not really understanding how to hinge the club well. And he gets that tendency to then lift his arms up really high. And then from there, that's what's going to get him, you know, steep over the top. And he's going to start scooping at it and do all the bad things that obviously we wouldn't want to see. So, you know, this is something that I'm always kind of looking at and players is, you know, do they have enough depth? And if they don't, why is it happening? And so when I watched Evan, I just noticed, all right, he doesn't hinge the club great. And I am seeing his body like to kind of stand up. And I was able to just relate it to him and be able to show him you know, in his swing, how his chest was lifting up an inch. And it was really easy then for us to be able to get it so that his hand path got a little bit more behind him as he started to learn how to hinge the golf club. Hey, Ryan, real quick. So yeah. one of the questions just come up and, and obviously can you, when you're using Sportsbox and you're the education uh, director for the, for Sportsbox and stuff, you have a program that everybody goes through. So the question kind of came up was, does the sports box app include movement graphs and as well as the values It kind of talk about it, it, Cause you're looking at these numbers real quickly and kind of going, this is, you know, this, and this, you do actually do education with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a, a certification. So our level one certification is already out there. Uh, Dr. Phil Cheatham and I are creating the level two certification. Uh, I think we're targeting like end of February is most likely when it's going to happen. Um, that one's going to go a lot more in depth on like graphs and being able to understand how to read everything there. Currently, we don't have graphs in Sportsbox, but it actually is going to be launching here very, very soon. If you're at the PGA show, you'll see our graphs when we're down there. We're going to have them to be able to show. Um, probably be just a little bit after the PGA show that we release it to the public then too. Um, we're also planning on doing uh, what we call like a boot camp, a 3D boot camp, uh, being able to help coaches understand and spend, you know, four to six weeks with us jumping on a 30 minute call and being able to help train and educate everybody with 3D. 
you know, me coming from a, a coaching background and, and looking at 3D and, and being one that really enjoys using 3D, I've always found it's been tough to find the information. It's not that accessible. It's not out there as much as, you know, what is like TrackMan data and being able to dive into that. And, you know, so many different areas of the golf swing, wrist data, like it's so easy to find amazing information. I've always felt like 3D has been pretty limited um, to be able to dive in and find that. There's a few areas that you can go for it, um, but it's not as public. So that's something that is our kind of mission for coaches is to be able to help educate you guys be able to show the value of 3D and make sure that all this stuff makes sense. All right, so once again, this is gonna be another player that doesn't get a whole lot of depth, right? So the first example, we noticed that the player wasn't hinging well. Um, and because he wasn't hinging well, it was making his arms lift and we actually could see his hands as they were lifting up. This player here, he's gonna be a little bit older gentleman, so he's not gonna move as well. And so what we're going to notice for him at the top of his swing, he only gets 79 degrees of turn. That's not a whole lot, right? Average, we want to get somewhere between 90 um, for the average. I think tour is like 91, 92. So obviously he doesn't turn a whole lot. And when you don't turn enough, that's going to make it so that the arms just can't get enough depth. Um, the other thing that we'll see for him is, and this is kind of a relationship that you'll see within 3D, is when a player doesn't turn a lot, they're going to have what we call more forward bend. So you can see his bend number at being at six degrees. You know, basically the spine has like a little bit of a tilt away from the target. Backward bend will be the opposite. And I'll, and I'll show you a really good example of backward bend. Um, so, but for right now, you're going to notice, you know, very little turn. You're going to notice more forward bend in a golf swing. And then that's going to be a, a big influencer in, in how a player moves. So for this player here, what we're going to see is he hits slices. And so when I pull up his pelvis weight, chest weight, because of that lack of depth, if you watch his pelvis and his chest, you're going to see how the pelvis is behind the chest here. So look at the chest number, see how it's 1.7 inches closer to the target. Pelvis is 0.9 towards the target. His chest is out in front of him. And what that does is it makes it so that his hand path starts pushing out on the way down and as it starts pushing out he gets steep he's going to start to lose his posture and that's where that like slice is going to come from the opposite of this that's like the same thing if you see somebody with very little turn too much forward bend the other thing that can happen is that they'll actually get their pelvis to start swaying too much towards the target and so they'll start to slide. And as they slide, their chest will stay back. And then that's going to be a player that's hitting hooks or pushes. So when you see a player with very little turn, not enough depth, too much forward bend, you know, there's going to be a pattern that kind of happens there. Are they going to be somebody that comes over the top where the chest gets out in front of the pelvis and the hands are then going to go pushing out? Or are they going to be a player that's learned to slide their hip, kind of get stuck and hang back on it with their chest a little bit and start hitting those hooks. So this is just another way that you can kind of see how 3D is easy to help kind of relate it to a player. You know, for this player, you can keep it really, really simple, right? When I broke down his golf swing, I just showed him, let's call him John, you know, hey, John, at the top of your swing, you're only moving 78 degrees. I want you to be able to turn a little bit more. And when we get you to turn more, it's going to be easier for you not to get your chest in front of your pelvis. What ends up happening when your chest gets out in front of the pelvis is those hands start to push out. You start to get steep. And that's where that slice is going to come from. You know, so you can keep this really, really simple for a player and you don't have to go too in depth with them then. All right. And then here we have another example of a player that just doesn't have a ton of depth. So for this player, I'm going to point out their pivot mainly. So for her, if you look at it from a face on view, I want you to pay attention to this player's pelvis. So on the way back, it's moved 0.5 uh, inches away from the target. And as she continues to take it up to the top, it's going to continue to move away from the target. 
you can notice how our chest is staying at you know zero. Now it's moving a little bit closer to the target. And so she gets, once again, a reverse pivot. I mean, as you guys know from teaching lessons, pretty much 90% of people don't know how to pivot and move around themselves properly. And so a lot of times you're probably going to be pointing out this relationship of pivot. And so for her, what we started to notice is as she started to get her chest tilting back towards the target, her hands started to just lift. And from a down the line view, she wasn't getting enough depth. You can kind of see how that left arm is above her right shoulder. You know, that just shows how she doesn't have the arms deep enough. Um, and then from there, though, she's pretty athletic. So she learned how to bow her wrist in order to try to get this club to come more from the inside. Um, but she's going to lose her posture a little bit um, while doing so. So that's just a, a really good way to kind of identify, all right, here's a player that doesn't have enough depth. Here is why uh, it could be happening. And then once again, you can keep it really, really simple as you're kind of talking to the player and why that's happening. So when I talked to her about this a little bit, we talked a little bit about setup because in her setup, if you look at that blue line, you can see how it's in front of the yellow line. So the blue line is representing the center of the chest. The yellow line is representing the center of the pelvis. And so for her, when she takes that club back already, she's going to be starting to tilt towards the target just because of a, a setup issue. I like to, me personally, I like to try to have my players with those num those lines stacked on top of one another or the chest a little bit behind the pelvis. Um, and so for her, that's all we really did is we just made it so that her chest was a little bit more behind that pelvis there. Uh, but as I told her, I just said, all right, so in your setup, what we want to do Let's make it so that you feel like your chest is a little bit more behind your pelvis. And then let's work on making sure that on the way back, your pelvis doesn't start to sway too much away from the target. So I ended up just taking an alignment stick, kind of running it right by her leg here. And she just had to work on creating some space from there. And as she did that, she started to turn around herself a little bit more, hands not lift up as much, and started to hit some really good shots. Cool. Any questions there? Perfect. All right. So just to kind of show you guys more like how I've used it in lessons um, and an actual example of one of my students here, Brandon. So Brandon came to me because he had a golf trip overseas and he's not really a huge golfer, um, but he wanted to be able to go and play with his brother over in, uh, I think Scotland is where he was at. So when we looked at his swing, you know, if you just look at it, how you typically would, you know, from that 2D analysis standpoint, we're watching him on the way back. You can notice how his chest, his head have clearly shifted, you know, pretty far away from the target there. And he just looks bunched up. So what I ended up doing, I just pulled up right away, held this way chest sway and I was able to show him like hey Brandon on the way back your head has moved three inches or your chest has moved three inches away from the target and your pelvis has moved 2.4 inches and when you moved that far away from the target that means on the way down you have to go back that much more and for him his chest is going to get out in front of that pelvis a little bit too much and what ends up happening is he starts to come way over the top and he'll actually start to shank it. He came to me with some really, really bad shanks. And it was mainly just because of his chest and his pelvis swaying too far off the golf ball. So one thing that we did notice too, is that his pelvis turn was at 37 degrees. And if I show his swing kind of like early on in the backswing, we can see how his pelvis just hasn't turned a whole lot. It's only turned 11 degrees. So when I was talking to Brandon in this first lesson, I said, all right, Brandon, what I want to work on with you is making sure that we can get your pelvis to open up and turn a little bit more. As your pelvis turns more, you're going to find it easier not to sway off the golf ball. And so the next week, as Brandon, you know, came back and we started working on this a little bit, you're going to see a pretty big change here. So on the way back, as he gets that club parallel in the backswing, now he's got 20 degrees, 19 degrees. 
of pelvis turn. We're actually going to notice that his pelvis and chest are starting to move a little bit closer towards the target on the way back um, compared to swing off the ball. And so he's learned now at the top of the swing how to be a lot more centered. Now, still has that tendency to sway off the ball, right? His chest is negative 1.3, but it's significantly less than where it was before, right? Before it was three inches. So it was a huge change for him being able to see how he was pivoting better. And honestly, all we did was just worked on him turning his hip more. You know, I put a little alignment stick going from that left heel or left toe to right heel and just tried to match his belt buckle to it as he got shaft parallel in the backswing. And so that's what we would do. And one of the best parts, and this is something that I think my players really enjoy about using 3D is that it helps quantify their swing thoughts. You know, to a player, they're not exactly sure what they're doing and they rely on us to give them some feedback as they're making these changes and if they're doing it right or wrong. The cool part about this is you know, as he's making these changes, we're able to tell him exactly how much his pelvis is turning. And so I'm not going to film every single swing, but I might go ahead and film three or four swings. And as you can kind of see, I can move back and forth um, easily between the two. Uh, I can look at those and just show him, all right, in those three swings, your pelvis has moved, you know, 14 degrees, 13 degrees, 15 degrees. And so he knows, all right, I still need to exaggerate it a little bit more. And so we go back to it, working on it a little bit, and we can start to shift him where we were at the end of that second lesson, which was that pelvis turning to 19 degrees, which was a huge, huge change for him. And you can just see the difference at the top, how much better of a, a pivot that looks like now. You know, still had the tendency of getting over the top, you know, just had to work on that a little bit, but just to show you guys like a practical use of this and how a player can really relate to it. You know, he was using this a lot to be able to feel, okay, how much am I turning? How much am I not? And like I said, I wasn't filming every single one. It was just being able to give him some insight. Um, he did use the app on his own when he practiced. So the app can become um, a practice tool. And so we have something called a watch list and, and I'll talk about that more towards the end and how we can really kind of connect our coaching to our players here while we're not there. Um, but when he used this to practice, he was able to get feedback. Am I doing this right or wrong without me being there, which was a huge value as well. Hey, Ryan, right. uh, we got a Yeah, that we got a right question. To the question. Hey. Yeah, uh, Billy had asked, um, is there a feature, and, and he related it to uh, KVS, but uh, like a, a training with biofeedback or any feedback, auditory feedback, anything like that um, for students say either you can use in lessons or if they do do the watch list, which I know you're going to cover later. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. So we currently don't have biofeedback. Um, it's something that we are working towards. We want to be able to do that where you can get live feedback and be able to be told like, all right, am I in the right position or not? Um, currently how I kind of describe it, it's more of that track man process, right? Player hits a shot, and then they can look and see, did I do that better or worse? Um, that's currently kind of how we do it. And that's what that watch list is going to be. So I'll just pull up one of my players here to kind of show the watch list. Um, let me pull up one of like his earlier swings. So you guys can kind of see his tendency and, um, you know, how bad it was before. Now, this is a really good player. Um you know, play at the University of Louisville. He, I've worked with him for a while now. He just turned professional. So looking at this player, you can see this watch list that just popped up, right? It shows chest bend and chest turn. So the first process of, you know, being able to, you know, kind of, a, kind of use this watch list is you first have to analyze the swing. So for Nick here, he has a tendency to hit draws. He loves hitting draws. Um, doesn't really like seeing a fade. Um, and what we ended up seeing on his track man numbers a lot of times was that he would be anywhere from like three to four degrees from the inside. But at times, all of a sudden, that the path number would start to get six, seven degrees inside. And then his angle of attack would start to get a little bit too shallow. Um, and obviously, when you're trying to play at a high level, it's pretty hard if you're not steep enough to get out of some of the, the thick rough that you're going to play in. 
And so for Nick, you know, we had to make it so that his path number became not as far from the inside, make it so that he can kind of hit down on it just a little bit more. And what we started to notice in his golf swing, as he takes this club up to the top of his swing, you know, he gets a lot of turn, right? 102 degrees, and then he'd get negative 14 degrees of backward bend. So his spine starts to actually tilt towards the target too much. And the issue with that is when you get all that extra turn and all that backward bend, it becomes very, very hard um, for a player to be strong enough to be able to turn their pelvis efficiently and properly. And so for Nick, he always had this tendency to start to slide too much in the downswing. And so at impact, he's at 6.5 inches of pelvis sway, which is the edge of the PGA Tour range. The average is four inches. Um, the range is basically three to six on the PGA Tour. So for him, he's on the outside of it. Now, at times, this pelvis sway number gets seven, eight inches. So this isn't even like too bad for him. Um, but what we ended up doing then is, is we created a watch list. I told him, hey, I need to get your swing to not have as much turn. Because as I talked about before, early on with that gentleman that had not enough turn and too much forward bend, if you have um, too much of it, that's when you start to get that backward bend. And so for Nick, that's very, very true. He gets 103 degrees. You can see his chest is closer to the target than his pelvis. So he gets a little bit of a, re of a reverse pivot. And that's kind of what was causing all of his issues. And so I created a watch list for Nick, and then he's able to practice with the app on his own. And that watch list, I'm able to assign him exactly the range that I want him to be in. So imagine like you're hitting on TrackMan and you could assign a range of club path and they could be told if that's good or bad. That's essentially what we do here. So for his chest bend, I wanted him to be negative 3.5 to positive 1.3. And then I wanted his chest turn to be anywhere from 90 to 95 degrees. Because if I go up to the top of his swing and you kind of see him at 95 degrees, you could see how he's at negative three degrees of bend. So that's kind of where I like to see him at the top of his swing. And so I created this watch list. And now anytime that Nick goes and practices, he instantly sees this watch list and he knows if he's in range or out of range. And so that's kind of our way of giving players feedback uh, and for coaches to get really quick, easy feedback of right or wrong. That way you don't have to go and analyze uh, every single swing in depth. You're just being told, was that better? Was it worse? Okay, they need to do it more or less. Um, so for Nick here, we can see, all right, this wasn't good. And then nowadays, Nick basically uses this all the time where he calibrates his swing with it. So if we go and look at Nick and pull up his swing, you're going to see a pretty big change in his numbers. So right away, that watch list, you can see how it pops up. And so when we go up to the top of his swing, he's going to have 0.7 degrees of bend and his chest turn is now at 90. And so this is how he's been able to practice with feedback without me being there. He's able to know, am I doing it right? Or am I doing it wrong? And, you know, I'm in a totally different place than he is. He's down in Florida. That times is in Louisville at times he's in Chicago. Um, and so all this has been able to be done pretty much remotely. I only see him, you know, maybe two, three times a year nowadays. Um, and so that's kind of our, way of doing it. But in the future, we want to be able to get it so that you guys have that biofeedback. We think it'll be a lot more possible when it's on a desktop version where the processing speed is fast enough. Hey, Ryan, just a quick question. Since you're talking about, uh, yeah. obviously we're measuring and you're, you're attempting to also get, you know, we want to get students to use the product to, to do a watch list and work on it themselves. How are you measuring um, the information. And what I mean by that is the, the reference point that is global reference point. Like when you do just to, uh, cause there's UK vest used on here, obviously you're, you're setting up a, 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 a target line, so to speak. So how is sports box measuring the information so that the student can set it up correctly? So we're getting accurate measurements. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, we, we always say it needs to be a standard face on video. So if the camera is skewed, right? If the camera's too much to the right, too much to the left, then some of the data is going to change. Um, so you want it to be basically face on, hand high, waist high is what we're looking for. 
Um, we also have a voice guidance feature, which tells the player exactly where to stand. They just turn it on, they hit record. And once they step up in the frame, it'll say, move to the right, move to the left, stand closer, stand farther their way. Um, that way, you know that they're going to get a good recording for yourself. Since I think if anybody does online lessons, it's like laughable to see some of the camera angles that we get to see. Uh, like I know I do a ton of them and it's just hilarious to see some of these angles. So that voice guidance feature is there to make our lives a lot easier where your student can just put it on a tripod. That's all they need. Just put it on a tripod and it tells them exactly where to stand. Um, so what we do is, is called 2D pose estimation. So essentially we're going to mark like 40 different points on the body. Okay. So there's all these little dots that are being measured and I'm just like kind of faking this because um, I'm not a biomechanist. So they just put all these points on there and they do that for like every single frame of the swing. And so when we're talking about like reference points, um, you know, <clears throat> the way that like K vest and gears work is you have to kind of calibrate it and make sure that you're to a target. For us, we wanted to make this as fast as possible. So we didn't want you to have to go ahead and, and have your player every single time they make a swing calibrate to where their target is. So we're more of a, you know, it, it's all off of where their feet are that we're going to be measuring from. Um, so you want to make sure that they're like aimed properly because that's going to give you good data. But if you have a player that's like way open in their stance, you're going to see that in the in the data there too. So hopefully that helped answer that. What other questions we have? So Ryan, we got some questions here that, um, you know, and, and this is when we're starting to look at numbers and stuff, talk about, you, you kind of made a comment there that you kind of said 20, then you said 19. So, you know, and the number actually said 19, but a lot of us sometimes when we start working with, with this, starts looking at numbers, the exact numbers. That's not exactly important, though, is it? I mean, how, how much do you need? To, I mean, a 19 to a 22, you know, in, in your measurements, how much is that going to be different? I mean, is that yeah. going to be? a? That's a really good question. So obviously, like specific numbers are great. But when I'm talking to a player, I don't want them to necessarily feel like they have to be exactly at this degree. Correct. Because it just it's not beneficial to them. So when I'm talking to a player, I'm talking more in ranges. I want you to be able to be between like 18 to 23 degrees. And then that way they know that there's a range for them that they need to learn how to swing within. Um, and so a lot of times when I'm, I'm looking at like a takeaway, for example, as we look at somebody where that shaft is parallel in the backswing, I do want to make sure that they have that 40 degrees of chest turn, 20 degrees of pelvis, um, because it really does make a big difference in, in how they pivot and how they move. Now, there are exceptions to this. There's a lot of different ways to swing a golf club. So you might get somebody that does have the lower end of that range. And so they aren't, aren't going to have as much turn. Um, and, you know, if they're moving properly, I'll probably just keep them there. But if it's somebody that, you know, doesn't have a ton of turn, there's somebody that sucks the golf club inside. Because uh, one thing that you'll notice is that classic club getting behind the hands on the way back a lot of times happens just because they haven't turned their pelvis they haven't turned their body well and they're just moving the arms and so a lot of times I'll just fix it by teaching them how to pivot properly and, and turn properly and so that's kind of how I use that but I'm always speaking in most of the time ranges and not exact numbers because there's always going to be a variance uh, for that player and how consistently they move it's just like if you're hitting on track, man, and at the end of the session, it shows you the consistency there. Those numbers are always changing. Um, and the same thing is going to be true with our 3D numbers. It's just being able to kind of help identify, all right, where is it going wrong that's like influencing the rest of the swing? And so for that, you know, one player of mine that I talked about, Brandon here, right, when we looked at his first swing and we saw that he only had that 11 degrees of, of bend or of a pelvis turn so as you see him take that club back and it's only 11 degrees I just told him like hey I want to get you anywhere from like 18 to 24 because I'm most of the time I'm going to try to have people exaggerate a little bit 
because they'll never be the the far end for the most part. And then that next lesson, you can see just the difference there and how much better it was. So now he's at 19 and, you know, really in this lesson, he was anywhere from like, I would say 16 degrees to like 21 degrees is where his max was when we did it. Hey, Ryan, can you do, um, we got, and by the way, just for everybody's, we're watching the questions. We're saving a few of these for um, more appropriate times, maybe right towards the end a little bit. Uh, so we see you. Uh, but I do have one that may, ap may apply from Ryan right now is, do they have, do you have the ability to do 3D side-by-sides with your students and tour player models? Yeah, yeah, you can. So to start, we currently don't have any like tour players inside the app, but we did give you guys the ability to import your own and create your own. So that way you can create your own tour library if you'd like. Um, so if I just like scroll down a little bit, let me just find a tour pro. Here's Xander Shoffley, right? I was able to just pull this right off of Instagram. It just needs to be a face on slow motion video that you want, you know, from that face on, hopefully waist high, hand high angle, and then you can analyze it and pull it up and you can save it as a, a 3D reference. So you can do this two different ways. You can do before and afters where you show your student, hey, this is you to start, this is you now, or you could do it, hey, here's you, the student versus the tour pro, however you wanna do that. And so you can see, you know, Xander's movement here and just how similar that avatar looks. And we got this right from Instagram. Now in the app at the top right of the corner, there's this little rectangle with a line through it. If you click on it, it allows you to do 2D versus 2D. So your standard analysis that you guys do in Coach Now or V1, you can do all that right within Sportsbox, um, but you could also do like 3D versus 3D. So maybe we want to compare Xander Shoffley to, let's see who I got here, Keith Mitchell. We can compare those two side by side. Roughly the analysis process you're kind of seeing it here takes... 15 seconds to go from that 2D to a 3D. So it's just quickly analyzing Keith Mitchell's swing. And then we can go just 3D. And now we can compare the two players. So we can compare Xander to uh, Keith Mitchell here. And then you can pull up whichever numbers you'd want to look at. At the bottom, there's a little chain link. So you can unlink them. And then now you can move both the players here. And then there's a golf club that allows you to sync the players up and you can see the difference between the two players. So we can see for Xander Shoffley, he gets a little bit more turn in the takeaway than, than uh, Keith Mitchell, but we are going to see that Keith Mitchell gets more turn overall in his swing. And if I click on the little, like what I call paragraph sign, this gives us numbers. This will show us the side-by-side -side comparison of where they're at. And then it's all color coded, yellow being on the either the edge of the range or just outside of it, green being good, and then red being outside the range. So you can actually get some feedback of like, hey, where's my student doing well and where they're not, if you're unfamiliar with obviously some of the 3D data here. So that's how you can compare two 3D swings to one another. That's awesome. It's great for before and afters. Like I use it for before and afters right. all the time. Um, you know, I don't teach full time anymore, um, but I still teach. I try to teach like 10 hours a week or so. And so for the people I do work with, it's like a pretty big investment that they're spending. So I have to show them, you know, why they're spending that money to be able to work with me. And this is exactly how I do it. I can show them right away in their first lesson. Hey, look at the difference I helped you with. And then obviously from when we started to when their their lesson pack is completed, I can show them that. And it makes it really easy for them just to keep signing up for more. Any other questions? Those are really good ones. Well, I mean, one question we had that, that we look at is, and then it's kind of, so do you, when you're using this, do you focus a lot on the setup and the backswing with most of your players? How, where, where are you looking? I mean, you've kind of done a few different people and yes, I'd say a lot of that is where you're looking. Mm -hmm. How do you, you know, 
how do you are you looking at those areas or looking at other areas also? Yeah, I'm I'm looking at the the overall full swing. I think it depends on who you are as a coach and and what your philosophy is and the fastest way to improve things. I think my personal philosophy is that if I improve somebody's backswing and improve where they are at the top, a lot of the times the downswing is going to clean up a lot. Um, if if things aren't organized in a in a really good way on the way back, there's probably going to be some sort of manipulation that happens on the way down for them to try to hit the ball well. And I see that in 3D all the time. I mean, just I always say the golf swing is a bunch of patterns. And based on how these people move to start and where they're at the top, it really shows us what their two options are going to be on the way down. There's some exceptions to the rule there, but for the most part, that's kind of like my belief. Um, but some coaches might focus more on the downswing, right? And and focus on a player sliding too much. And you're able to look at that too. So, you know, maybe I pull up somebody with like a lack of width, right? When you have a lack of width, your right arm starts to, to bend a little bit too much. You know, that player might have a tendency to start to slide a lot because they need a little bit more time to get that right arm extended. And so this is a, a gentleman I work with that we'll see as he goes up to the top, you can kind of see how that right arm's folding towards him a little bit. Doesn't get a ton of width. This is actually better than where he was. But at times, his pelvis then would go sliding forward a little too much. And so when he started with me, his pelvis sway was at seven and a half inches. And then at the top of his swing, when we look at his trail elbow flexion, it's towards the bottom, it says 80 here. Um, that used to be like 60. So that right arm was like really, really collapsing. And then because of that, he was sliding even more. So for him, this actually isn't too bad. I really like where his width is here, um, but he still has that tendency to slide a little bit. So now for him, we're working on being able to get rid of some of that sliding um, in the swing. And, you know, this is probably a little too technical, but for him, what we start to see is his left hip we'll get a little high in transition. So we've been trying to get it to lower a little bit more. So you can see how he's at like negative six and then it goes high. I'm trying to get that to be just a little lower where it's like negative seven, negative eight. But like I said, that's probably a little technical there. Um, if we go to the other player, this is actually a, a good player. You'll see once again, top of the swing, not a whole lot of width here. If we look at his trail elbow flexion, you'll see it's 62 degrees. And then because of that, you're going to see how his body starts to really slide towards the target. So you can look at impact. You can be able to show a player how they're moving. Um, you know, for me, I think it's really easy. Just get him more width, and you'll see that he slides less, but some coaches might be okay with seeing the, the right arm bend a little bit more. It's all, you know, kind of preference at that point. Ryan, we also had a question uh, since we're just talking about how the app works and and yeah. some other things. We had a question earlier about could you use could you or will there be an opportunity maybe to use it for putting? Yeah, we're working on putting. It'll probably be a little bit of ways. Um, you know, it's just it's like a whole different model that you have to do for putting. Um, so we've been working with some putting coaches and and just trying to make sure that we get the useful data and building all the algorithms and everything there. So. It'll be a little bit down the road, but that is something that is on our roadmap. Ryan, like, have you have used it with the chip with short game? Have you used yeah, it with chipping yeah. and stuff? So you can do, I would say pitch shots are pretty good. Chip shots um, sometimes don't work. So how it works, right? It's that 2D pose estimation. So we've trained an AI to be able to measure those 40 points on the body. And so when we started, it took us a year to go through and label all these points for every single frame and teach the AI essentially what a golf swing looks like. And when we started, the swing basically had to be a full swing. Otherwise, the AI would just assume that's not a golf swing. And it would just say, nope, wouldn't work. When we eventually went to market, it was definitely a lot like better, but there wasn't as much leniency towards it. So if you had somebody swinging like halfway back and going through, it wouldn't pick that up to start. Nowadays, it's been really, really good. Like I've been able to do chipping. I've been able to do pitching. The AI has just gotten so smart and so good and being able to 
have its tolerance of like what a golf swing is that you'll have really good short game data. So what I kind of take is like a rule of thumb for right now is, you know, roughly I would say like here, you know, shaft parallel on the backswing and through should always pretty much work nowadays. Um, sometimes it can get a little bit shorter, but if it gets too short, it might give you a swing and a miss, but just know like all the data gets fed to the AI. And so, you know, if it doesn't work now, give it three, four months and eventually it'll be where chip shot doesn't, doesn't ever give you a swing and a miss. Great. Well, Ryan, let's talk. So now we're going to get into, you know, some people asking, well, what do I need to have? What do I need to buy? So yeah. talk a little bit. I know that you're not exactly the sales guy, but you know, just kind of give an idea of what, what, what it's, what somebody needs. They only need their phone really. So, I mean, they don't really need to buy any extra equipment, mm -hmm. but what, are, what are, to use the app and stuff, what are they going to need to do? Yeah. I mean, that's the, the best part about it is you don't have to wait on us to send you anything. So all you have to do is go to the app store on your phone. We work on both Android and Apple. Uh, Apple is going to be like a, a release ahead. So there might be some features that you get on Apple that isn't there yet on Android. Um, it's just because we have so many more Apple users um, that we're going to be able to get to them a little bit sooner. So just go right on your phone, download Sportsbox 3D Golf, and then you can sign up right there. Uh, I like having a tripod just because you want to keep the camera somewhat still. If the camera is moving a lot, you know, it is going to change some of the data that goes there. Or like you'd see it in the hand path lines. As I drew those hand path lines, it'd get a little jagged. Um, so a tripod does help. You can do it handheld. I've done it plenty handheld, especially from like the course. Um, but at times you might want to use a tripod there too. Uh, I like showing it on an iPad. So this is on an iPad right now. There's just a little bit more space for it. Um, but I record on my phone. So basically my lesson setup, I just have a tripod that's on the face on and I just stick my phone there. And then when anytime I want to go and record, I just click record and then it automatically uploads to my iPad. And then I just show my student right on the iPad. So you could record on an iPad too. It does work. I suggest the iPad Pro because the camera is better. So you're going to have a little bit easier use because the brightness will be really nice and um you can also zoom out on the iPad Pro, which comes in handy if you're in a tight space. Because if you're at a range, for example, with like a bay divider, that bay divider, if it covers up the golfer, will trigger a swing and a miss. So you could stand right next to the bay divider, zoom out, and it works no problem. So yeah, I would just say a tripod is all you really need, but it's not even a requirement. Ryan, and if you do have your... Uh, oh, go ahead, Sean. Go ahead, Mark. Okay, so... One thing that uh, with the iPad, when you use it, I've done is you can airtime to a TV because, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned that you're looking at a PC version, which I've talked to, uh, I haven't talked to you, but I've talked to other to uh, uh, guys about at the company that that's something I want is I want the PC version because I can put it on my computer and put it on my TV screens real easily. Uh, but you can also take that and airtime it to your television and be able to, to use it kind of up on a television also if you do iPad. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good way to do it. And we're working towards that, getting a computer version of it. In the near term, there are little releases that we're going to have that make it easier to use in that studio setting. Um, so what we did at the PGA show is we created it a way for you to be able to put your phone on the, the tripod and then from your iPad to be able to hit record and stop and then do everything from there. That way you wouldn't have to go to the face on and click start and stop. Wherever you're standing, you can just click it right on your iPad. So that'll be here sooner rather than later. Um, you'll probably see that if you're at the PGA show, you'll see a version of it. And we used that at the President's Cup and it was incredible. Ryan, I know there's, um, first off, and again, as Sean said, I know you're doing the education side, but um, We'll, we'll definitely want you to just make sure we're clear about where folks can go to get an idea of the mm -hmm. pricing options and the plans because there are, there are multiple. Um, but from a student perspective, you want to get a student doing it and using the watch list. Um, you guys are nice to do this for us and everything, but you're not doing it for free. 
So what, what does the student have to, what, what's the student got to do to buy in? What, what's their, their, uh, their input? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a free version for the student and then there's a paid version. The, the free version for the student, what it allows them to do is look at everything that you've put in there. So any lesson that they've had with you, they can go in and look at it. Um, they can message you within an inbox and they can even see that watch list and like, okay, was this a good swing or a bad swing? Um, the paid version, it actually allows them to then practice with the app. So it's $110 for the year or $15.99 a month. I always tell people just buy the year because after six months, you basically paid for the same thing. Um, and so then from there, they're able to actually go to the range, record themselves and get instant feedback. And so it's really nice, you know, for my students, as we were kind of like piloting this and demoing this and, and trying to get an understanding of, you know, what's valuable to them. Um, they found a ton of value in just being able to understand, am I doing this right or wrong? And just to give you guys some understanding, like how my lessons work is, you know, they come in, I do a video analysis. I then, you know, we go into like the drills and the things we're working on and I give them drill videos and I give them these, you know, practice stations that way they're getting some sort of feedback, but they all came to me and I didn't really know this. They never really voiced this before. They all came to me and were like, man, it was really nice to have complete clarity on if I was doing something right or wrong. In that drill, I was doing it what felt right, but I really didn't know. And without you there, I don't know. And so it really acts as another coach. So that's why my students really like it. Um, I've built it into all my like lesson plans now. So anytime somebody buys a lesson package from me, they just get a year of sports box. Got it. Okay. Uh, we do have one other question and we'll kind of wrap it up here, Ryan yeah. is, is, um, uh, Steven was asking, does it integrate with any of the, the launch monitors, TrackMan, GC quad, any of them, or is there any, uh, plan to maybe work your way towards that? Yeah. So we signed a partnership with foresight. So we're starting with GC quads. We're going to have an integration with them. So, um, if you have a GC quad, you know, that there's not an app that they have they're going to consider us their app. So you'd go to uh, the app store, download Sportsbox, and then you'll be able to actually get that data um, right inside of our app. So we're really excited about that. Uh, we haven't released it just yet. We're working on that integration phase, um, but it'll be here sooner rather than later. So we're really excited about that integration. We don't have any integration with like force plates, anything like that. Um, Right now, our partners that we have are with um, Golf Genius and then with Foresight. Awesome. Um, Ryan, before we sort of uh, let you go here and, and don't everybody jump too quick because we want to make sure we cover the, the upcoming schedule. Um, Ryan, just one last thing is, is uh, uh, let everybody know where they can sort of, again, just find you guys. Any other information you want people to know? um, to get, uh, to get them headed your way. Yeah. So we're on social media. You can always find us there. Sportsbox AI is what you can search and follow us there on Instagram. If you want to get started with the app, we have a two week free trial. So you can either go to the app store and just download the app and register there, or you could go to our website, sportsbox.ai, and then you just click on the pricing page. We do have multiple options there for you guys. So we have a pro light and a pro premium. Um, basically, the difference between the two is the amount of student spaces that you can manage within an app. You could still show everybody their swing if they're not a student, um, but it's really nice from like an organizational standpoint to be able to have everything in one spot. So that's the main difference between the pro light and the pro premium currently. The pro light is $65 a month or 650 for a year. So you're gonna save two months if you go with the annual plan. And then the pro premium is $189 per month. Or if you wanna go the year, once again, it's 1,890, you save that two months there. Awesome. So Ryan, real quick too, you got a question and uh, you mentioned social media. So one, there's a lot of educational information on the YouTube channel that you have as well as you actually do do the education. Uh, you, you send the link through the education. You want to talk about the education a little bit? 
Yeah. Yeah. So we do have our level one certification. It's on a separate site. Um, so I can send it to everybody just to make it really easy. Um, it's $200 for the certification. It takes roughly two and a half hours. You get three MSR credits for it. And Dr. Phil Cheatham and I were the ones that created it. So, you know, it's the basics of biomechanics, just kind of understanding, hey, what are we measuring? What are we looking at? You know, giving you guys an understanding, what are the ranges that the PGA and LPGA Tour players are going to swing within? Um, and then from there, being able to uh, come up with some just simple ways to teach with it. Because like I said, you know, I think it's a, a myth that 3D is meant for good players. You can keep this as simple as you guys want. And so there's some really simple ways to be able to find those common faults that you might see on your lesson T there. And then level two will come out, you know, like I said, probably end of February uh, is most likely when it'll come out. That one's going to be a little bit more extensive. So there's going to be a lot more to it from a, a teaching and understanding like cause and effect and, and how certain movements influence one another. And then Phil's really going to dive into graphs 